One of the few things in endonics that is universally accepted and is not even debated anymore, it's not controversial at all, is the rubber dam application and isolation during root canal therapy. The efficacy of rubber dam isolation has been proven scientifically beyond reasonable doubt. In fact, this concept is so uncontroversial today that in the United States, it's the standard of care in all 50 states, and root canal therapy without a rubber dam is considered a clear case of negligence in all those states. By the way, other tools like Isolite and Dry Shield are not substitutes for rubber dam isolation because the main purpose of rubber dam isolation is to avoid contamination of field by bacteria and biofilm present on the tongue and in the saliva, as well as the exhaled breath, all of which contain large volumes of microbes. I call rubber dam isolation primary isolation and emphasize its proper application in all cases during my courses. Now, a good primary isolation is not only important for successful clinical outcomes, once you get used to its quick application, it will expedite your treatment and it will also provide a safer as well as a more efficient workflow for your cases. But despite the best rubber dam isolation, a small gap is always present between the rubber dam and the clamp where curricular fluid can seep out. Now, since the microbial composition of the curricular fluid has been shown to be the same as that found in the endodontic infections, it is important to avoid getting any of this fluid into the root canal during root canal therapy, and especially during the root canal obturation. This is particularly important during vital pulp therapy also, where your success is largely dependent on your aseptic technique and avoiding bacterial contamination of the pulp. This is why I've been recommending what I now call a secondary isolation concept, which involves the addition of various caulking or sealing materials to the natural gaps in your primary isolation in order to improve the seal against saliva, breath, and crevicular fluid. While there are a number of options for you guys out there on the market to achieve this end, I found that light cured materials are usually the most convenient for use clinically for this particular purpose. Now, the non-setting materials are basically different formulations of a denture adhesive and can turn into particular materials and can float away during irrigation as well as the use of ultrasonics. And this is why I've been recommending light cure flowable materials that set with non-adhesive resin materials of various viscosities and rigidities. Now, one such barrier is the endosequence flowable dam material, which is the recent addition to our endosequence line of products. This barrier material is an inexpensive syringable plastic that can be placed and cured over the seams between the rubber dam and the clamp or any in proximal areas where deep decay was removed to achieve temporary isolation during root canal therapy. Now what's nice also is that it can also be easily removed at the end of the procedure. Achieving fluid tight seal through secondary isolation by the addition of a caulking material to your primary rubber dam isolation has two main benefits. It prevents seepage of the curricular fluid and saliva from the seams and tears that are present around your rubber dam clamp complex when you try to isolate a tooth, while it also equally prevents the leakage of sodium hypochlorite or any other bad tasting disinfectants and other kind of uh, solvents and chemicals into the patient's mouth during root canal therapy. Now we've all heard of a poor patient gargling under the rubber dam after tasting a little bit of sodium hypochlorite leaking around the rubber dam. That is not a good sound and we all want to avoid that, right? So now how to apply this caulking material? Well, it's very important to dry the field and by that I mean that you are trying to dry both the rubber dam as well as the tooth and the area you're going to apply this material as well as you can with air before applying the material. If you have any fluid film on any of the surfaces, the resin will not stick, obviously. After drying the field, place the endosequence flowable dam material around the tooth and or around any of the areas that you're trying to create the seal and let it sit for five seconds and then cure it with your curing light. You can test the seal by flooding the tooth with hypochlorite to make sure that you have a fluid tight seal. The advantages of the endosequence flowable dam material is that it's easy to apply, it's more elastic and malleable, and its removal at the end of the procedure is much easier than some of the other caulking materials on the market that are rigid and may have to be drilled out at the end of the procedure. Also, it's less expensive, which is always a welcome thing. In areas where isolation quality needs to be at its best, such as the interproximal areas where significant decay was present, the use of a dual cure BC liner is recommended as it's always better to bond to dentin in these areas for the best seal. 
Anyway, just wanted to share with you guys this new item, which I'm sure it will help improve your secondary isolation and can help you achieve better contamination control, which is really the cornerstone of a better clinical outcome for all your root canal therapy cases. As usual, if you have any questions or concerns, comment below this video or drop me a line on our website. For people that know, I'm Ali Nisset, and let's save some tea.